I'd like to begin my message this morning by talking to you about my vegetable garden. If you've been at our church for a while, you will have heard me talk about my beloved vegetable garden before and probably accidentally let a bit of an eye roll out uh, as I said I'd be talking about my vegetable garden again. Uh, but I have not mentioned it for a while, so I hope you'll give me a bit of grace. For those of you who don't know, my wife and I are avid veggie gardeners. Uh, to give you a bit of context, uh, I've pulled up the Google Street View of our house, and our front yard looks like this. Uh, so, uh, yeah, that's the, that's the front of our house, um, and we kind of turned it into a farm, uh, which was better than the dead lawn that was there beforehand. But, uh, so we love to garden, as you can see, we are all in. And August is the time of year where we start planting our seeds for our fall garden. These are the plants that don't like a lot of heat, but the relative warmth and sunlight of a central valley fall is perfect for them. Uh, right now we have our little seedling area set up, so these are all our seedlings, some of them already in the ground as well, these are our seedlings uh, right now. Uh, we've got broccoli and cabbages, cauliflower, rutabaga, lettuce, uh, what else do we have, beets, lettuce, chard, and all kinds of other yummy leafy greens. And um, Because they're all seedlings, they all fit on this one table right now. But this represents a vast amount of food that will, Lord willing, feed our family with glorious nutrients and flavors for the next few months. And while all that looks like a lot, it's actually not that much work. It requires intentionality and a plan, but for those seedlings, all I have done is put some dirt in some trays or pots, poked a hole, dropped a seed in, and made it wet. That's it. That's all I had to do. It's not a huge amount of effort. Now, I'll be honest, I could definitely mess up the process. I could not water them, and then they wouldn't grow. They would die in our harsh August sun. I could mess it up by changing the location of the seedling table. I could move it into the garage out of direct sunlight, and the plants wouldn't thrive. They wouldn't grow because they need the sunlight uh, to survive. I did lose a few seedlings last weekend. Uh, last weekend, if you remember, it cooled down. We had those strong breezes in the evening. What I should have done is move the table under our patio to give it a bit of shelter, uh, but I didn't, and so some of the plants weren't strong enough in their seedling stage. stage they lost their ability to stand. They fell over, and they're not going to recover, but the strongest alive. Uh, so I could definitely mess up the process, uh, but as long as I keep them well watered and in good daylight, they should grow fine. The honest answer is that I'm not the one doing the real work to make these plants grow, but believe me, there is a huge amount of work going on. When the sun is hitting the leaves of those plants, photosynthesis is happening. As the plants are energized by the sun's rays, they take in carbon dioxide from the air and water from the soil, and they produce sugar, and as a byproduct, they produce some handy oxygen for us. The plant uses this sugar for all its energy needs, for the constant cell division and growth that is happening. But it also turns a lot of those sugars into something called root exudate, which it seeps out through its roots and makes a tasty, sweet soil colony around its root system. Soil microbes that are in the soil feed on that sweet soil, and as a waste product, after they digest the soil, they release the nitrogen, the phosphorus, and potassium, the big three nutrients that all plants need. The plant roots take up all these nutrients, which in turn make the plant healthier, grow stronger, more leaves, more photosynthesis, more sugars, more sweet, sweet root exudate. So there are millions and millions of plant cells, and billions and billions of microbes at work to make these plants grow. Somebody once told me that there is more life in a t tablespoon of soil than there are human beings on the earth. All I do is put some dirt in a pot, put a seed in it, and keep it wet. But God has set up all these creatures and all these processes to make it happen. He designed them. He created them by his mighty power. The difference in the amount of work between what I do and what God does and has done is hardly worth comparing. And in our passage today, it is this same gardening analogy that the Apostle Paul is going to use to help us understand God's work among his people, the church. This is going to be our last week in this section of the Church Is series. Next week, we're going to catch up with Jesus on his journey to Jerusalem in the Gospel of Luke. One of my goals in delivering this series 
has been to stir our hearts to love the church of God more. I believe that if a Christ follower is growing to love God more, then they will grow to love the things that God loves more. And there are a few things that God loves more than his own people. And so a growing Christian will have a growing love for the church. And I don't just mean that the big C church, the whole congregation of God's people throughout the world and throughout history, though an appreciation of the big C church will also grow. But that big C church reality is lived out in the context of these local gatherings, these local ecclesias of God's people. And my desire is that we would all become more passionate about our particular church family and to live out our calling as a church family. But we struggle because we live in an individualized culture. That is the heartbeat of the Western world, the the priority of the individual over the group. And that has some benefits to it as well as some cons. But it can filter too much into our church culture as well. We talk very much about our personal relationship with Christ. And yet we don't talk much about our corporate responsibility to the church of God's people. We may recognize our need for the organization that we call the church. We need a place to come and worship and to hear the scriptures being taught. But we don't think we really need the people around us or that we have any direct responsibility for them. But my hope in teaching through this series on what the church is, and also from our two, three principle series last year, is that we would grow in our love and our passion for the church, particularly this body of believers that we call our church family here at FBCC. Over the last couple of weeks, we've looked at a couple of pairs of images that the New Testament authors used to describe the church. We saw that the church is both a temple and a priesthood. The dwelling place of God is no longer in some tent or in a building. Rather, God dwells in the very midst of his people by his spirit. That's what makes us a temple. We are the dwelling place of God. And since the spirit of God is among us, we are called to be priests to one another, responsible for drawing one another to God. And last week we saw that the church is the pillar and buttress of the truth. The church's role is to hold aloft the truth of God. And we saw that the truth is so transformative, both in bringing people to faith and to growing people in faith. But at the same time, lies are so dangerous that we need to stand firm against them. Well, today we're going to look at another pair of images that the New Testament gives us to describe what the church is. We're going to see that the church is a field and a building. We're going to be spending most of our time in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. So if you have your Bible with you or a Bible app, let me encourage you to open up to 1 Corinthians 3 and we'll begin reading from there in just a moment. And the letter called 1 Corinthians was written by the Apostle Paul to a church he had planted in a city called Colossae, which that city, uh, or its ruins now, are in modern day Turkey. And if you've read this letter before, you will know that this church in that city could be summed up with one word, messy. In fact, when we preached through 1 Corinthians several years ago, we called that sermon series Messy Church. And they had all kinds of problems in that church. They were an argumentative bunch who even got to the point of suing one another. They would take one another, a fellow Christ follower, uh, before a non-Christian judge to settle disputes that should be settled within the church family. There were others in the church who were celebrating sexual sin, and yet there were others who were saying that a husband shouldn't be even intimate with his wife. Their communion services were a free-for-all, and their regular church services were just a competition to see who could express their spiritual gifts the loudest. Let me read to you the beginning of 1 Corinthians 3, and we'll see an example of how Paul describes the infancy of this church. Beginning in verse 1. Brothers and sisters, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you are not yet ready for it. Indeed, you're still not ready, for you are still worldly. 
For since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere humans? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not mere human beings? So in this case, there are people in the church arguing over which leaders followed. Uh, There were some people uh, who followed Paul. Paul had visited Corinth and planted the church there. And then after Paul had left, uh, a guy called Apollos came along. He was another disciple maker and Bible teacher, and he worked with the church. And so there were some who claimed that they were more of a Paul fan. Others claimed they were more of an Apollos man. Earlier in the letter, we find that there were even people who tried to play the trump card by saying they don't follow any human leader, they only follow Jesus. But Paul utilizes this argument that they're having to teach about the role of leaders in the church, and even the role of all God's people in the work of God's kingdom. And we'll see Paul first use this analogy that the church is a field. Let me read the next few verses of 1 Corinthians 3 for us. What, after all, is Apollos, and what is Paul? Only servants through whom you came to believe, as the Lord has assigned to each his task. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. The one who plants and the one who waters have one purpose, and they will each be rewarded according to their own labor. For we are co-workers in God's service. You are God's field. So we can see a few truths about the work of God's kingdom in these verses. Firstly, we see what the work of the servant is. And that's in verses 5 and 6. What after all is Apollos and what is Paul? Only servants, only servants through whom you came to believe as the Lord has assigned to each his task. So rather than the believers in Corinth arguing over which of these leaders they think is best, they need to realize that all these leaders are only servants. You can realize how ridiculous this is if you put it in the context of a music concert. Whether you're a Swifty or whether you get more excited when the Eagles come into town, when you go to a concert, you go to watch the star of the show. But imagine going to a concert with a friend, and instead of watching the performance, you spent the whole time arguing over which road he was running the cables better. You're at a concert to watch the musicians, but you're arguing over the servants. Similarly, the believers in Corinth shouldn't have been arguing over Paul and Apollos. They are just the Lord's roadies. They're just the Lord's servants. Instead, they should have their focus and attention on the Lord himself. The word servant is one of the words that Paul commonly uses to describe himself. Given his spiritual prowess and his fame, it could be easy for him to become conceited and filled with pride. But he kept reminding himself and others that he was just a servant of the Lord. This is from Philippians chapter 1 verse 1. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus. And his introduction to Titus, he says, Paul, a servant of God, and an apostle of Jesus Christ. And as a servant, Paul recognizes that his job is only to do the task that the Lord assigned to him. And in verse 6, Paul draws on this analogy of growing plants. He says it was his job to plant the seed. He was the first one to show up in the city of Corinth with the gospel, and he shared the gospel there and began the work of making disciples and planting a church. But that was just him fulfilling the task that the Lord had assigned to him. Then he says it was Apollos' job to come along after him and water the seed. He continued the work and helped the believers in the church family to grow. But these guys were just fulfilling the tasks that the Lord had assigned to them. As with my seedlings, the task of planting the seed in the soil and watering it is important work, but it's not hard work. The planting and the watering are not the ultimate cause for the growth. Now, I recognize that preaching the gospel and discipling people is much harder work than putting a seed in some soil and pouring water in a seed tray. Because of his work as a servant, Paul faced persecution and imprisonment. I tend not to make many enemies when I'm planting broccoli seeds. 
But in comparison to the transformational resurrection work that the Lord is doing in saving his people, our work is very minimal. And that brings us to the next truth about this kingdom work. It is the work of the Lord. This is continuing from verse 6. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. God has been making it grow. Just like the seeds in the soil grow by the creative design power of our creative God, so God's people sprout and grow by His power and His power alone. That means that we cannot do it. We cannot make people grow. It is literally impossible for us to make somebody become a believer. It's impossible for us to make somebody grow in their faith. That is the work of the Lord and the work of the Lord alone. No matter what we do, we cannot make this happen. No sermon I could give could ever transform somebody from death to life. No Bible study you ever do would ever be able to help you grow by itself. Sermons, Bible studies, and things like that are things that God often uses to help people grow, but it is all a work of God. It is impossible for us to manifest this of our own will. And while that may sound defeating, it is actually the single biggest truth that brings freedom in our work for the Lord. The ultimate result of the work is not up to us. It is beyond our power. It is above our pay grade. The growth of the people in this church family is ultimately up to me. As the pastor here, I am the servant. I am a servant. I am called to fulfill my role faithfully. I am to strive to rightly handle the words of truth. But my words cannot make people grow. I may use my words to help people grow, but God can and does often work in spite of me. But this goes for all of our work for God's kingdom. You may be teaching kids in the children's ministry or in the youth. You may be leading a Bible study or teaching the gospel to people in some other capacity. But it's not your role to make growth happen. That is beyond your capability. That is God's role. If you've got kids at home, I hope you're striving to raise them in the Lord, but their growth is ultimately not up to you. It's not your role. You are to be a faithful servant and to obey the calls that God has for you as parents to raise your kids in the knowledge and fear of the Lord, but you cannot cause growth. You can only do the work of planting and watering. And this is even true in our evangelism. If you're praying and seeking to share the gospel with a loved family member or friend, it is absolutely impossible for you to save them. You do not have the ability to open their blind eyes. You do not have the ability to raise them from death to life. All you can do is faithfully share the gospel with them and pray. That is our role. And that is absolutely freeing. Because imagine if it did depend on you. Imagine if the eternal souls of your kids, your family, and friends, and your brothers and sisters in church depended on you perfectly fulfilling your role. That would be a crushing weight to bear. But God gives us a few relatively simple tasks to do. And it is, it is the work of the Lord, and the work of the Lord alone, that causes growth. But even though it is the Lord who does all the heavy lifting in this work, He still promises a reward for our faithfulness. That's the next truth we see about the kingdom work of God in verses 8 to 9. The one who plants and the one who waters have one purpose, and they will each be rewarded according to their own labor. For we are co-workers in God's service, you are God's field." In those two verses, I think there are two realities that should be absolutely astonishing to us. First, the idea of us being rewarded seems way out of balance. Our work compared to God is so uh, small. It's so tiny when we compare it to His. He is the one who is creating new life, the one who has made all these processes of making us grow. All we do is plant the seed and water it. 
And yet God still promises to, do, to reward us for our faithful work, even though our work is so small. But the second astonishing reality is that we are called God's co-workers. We usually think of co-workers as people who are doing a similar task. But God's tasks and our tasks are on hugely different scales. Jeff Bezos, you'll probably know, is the founder and executive chair of Amazon.com. He is technically a co-worker of the janitor who cleans his office. They both work at the same location, but they're on completely different levels. Obviously, they are both equally valued and precious as human beings, but if the janitor quit his job tomorrow, they would just hire someone else and most people wouldn't notice the difference. But if Jeff Bezos quit tomorrow, it would make international news and cause a stir on the stock market that would affect other companies and would have an impact on pretty much everyone's retirement account. But the difference between the janitor and Jeff Bezos is still less than the difference between us and God, and yet we're still called God's co-workers. But we also need to remember that at the same time as being co-workers, we are also the very work of God. That's why Paul finishes this section by calling us God's field. The church is called a field because it is the field in which God is constantly going about his work of growing. He is always at work, causing his people uh, to grow fertilizing the soil with his words, pruning off the rotten parts, and shining the good radiance of his goodness down upon us. But Paul finishes verse 9 by quickly switching analogy. He switches from the idea that the church is a field to the fact that the church is a building. Let me continue reading. You are God's building. By the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as a wise builder, and someone else is building on it. But each one should build with care, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, their work will be shown for what it is, because the fire will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. If it is burned up, the builder will suffer loss, but yet, it will, but yet will be saved, even though only as one escaping through the flames. Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in your midst? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person, for God's temple is sacred and you together are that temple. So we've already looked at the idea that the church is a temple. The church is the place where God's spirit dwells. But this passage is less focused on the type of building that has been built and more on the process of how the building is built. Again, we see the idea of each of us having our role to play. Paul says that he laid a foundation which is analogous to him planting a seed in the field. And there are others who are building on that foundation which compares to people watering that seed. But this passage also includes a warning that each one should build with care. And we're told to be careful for three things. First, in verse 11, Paul tells us to be careful to build on the right foundation. And he says that that foundation is none other than Jesus. We saw a couple of weeks ago in the words of Peter that Jesus is the cornerstone of the new temple that God is building of his people. And here again, we see that Jesus is the foundation, the basis on which our whole faith is built. Last week, we spoke about how the gospel isn't just an entry point into the Christian faith that we graduate and move on from. Rather, the gospel is the center point of our faith that everything else orbits around. The gospel is the good news of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus for the salvation of our souls. We are not free to make anything else central. No other passion, no other pet project, no other agenda, no other political topic, no matter how worthy we think they may be, 
only the gospel can be central. We need to be careful to only build on the foundation of Jesus. And second, Paul warns us to be careful to build with good materials. Look at verse 12. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, their work will be shown for what it is, because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. Kind of sounds like a setup to the three little pigs story, doesn't it? He huffed and he puffed and he blew the house in. But the materials that Paul lists fall into two groups. On one hand, there are good materials, the gold, silver, and the precious stones. And on the other hand, there are not so good materials, the wood, hay, and the straw. These groups uh, differ in many different ways. Firstly, they differ in strength. We know that wood has some strength to it. We have our timber frame houses, but they don't make high-rise buildings out of wood. Hay and straw, they're not strong materials at all. But stone, gold, and silver are very, very strong. Second, they differ in their durability. Wood, hay, and straw are all organic materials, and so they will eventually decay. Wood if you preserve wood in the right conditions, it will last a long time, but it loses its integrity and strength. But in comparison, gold, silver, and stone can last for millennia. When we were in England earlier this year, we took the kids to a place called Peveril Castle. This is a castle that was built in the year 1086. It's a ruin of a castle now, as you can see, but a lot of the stonework still survives almost a thousand years later. But the, the courtyard of a castle within the castle walls was filled with timber buildings at the height of the castle when it was running, but they are all have long since been decayed and removed. And the stonework itself would be in better condition, but as the castle was abandoned and no one lived there anymore, people from the nearby by villages would go and take stone and use it to build their homes. Third, these materials differ in their time to produce or harvest. Gold and silver need to be mined, and the ore needs to be processed. Stone needs the hard work of quarrying. Plus, the listed material isn't just blocks of sandstone or granite that they're quarrying. These are precious stones. These all involve a lot of hard work, which is why these materials are of great value. To get some wood, you just need to fell a tree and plank it. I mean, it's not easy work, but it's easier than quarrying and mining and processing ore. And hay and straw are easy to come by. That's why they're cheap in comparison. And fourth, these materials differ in their flammability. Notice how one group are extremely flammable, hay, straw, and wood. We use wood for one of the primary reasons we use wood is for building a fire. But the others are far less flammable, stone, silver, and gold. In fact, instead of being destroyed by fire like the other materials, these materials can often be refined by fire. And so as we build on the foundation of Christ, we need to be careful that we're building with the right materials because it will only be truly brought to light on what Paul calls the day. The day will bring it to light. On the final day, our work for the Lord will be tested by fire. The flammable materials will burn up, but the strong materials will prove solid. Now, Paul doesn't tell us exactly what he is thinking of in these different categories of materials. He doesn't say the hay represents this, the gold represents this. But let me give you one example of where my mind goes as I think about these things. As we parent, it's important to ask ourselves what we're building into the lives of our kids, what we're building up our kids with. What materials are we using to build the lives of our children? Are we using the enduring truths of God's Word, or are we using the values of this world? While we never say it's our intention, we can often fall into the mistake of building and training our kids to believe that the most important thing in life is wealth and success by how we encourage their schooling and activities, by what we tell them off for, and how we parent in general teaches our kids what is important. We know that wealth and success are not ultimately the best thing for our kid. We know that wealth is not guaranteed to be durable. We know that wealth doesn't bring joy. 
And yet it can be so tempting for us to pursue it and train our kids that this is the most important thing. We can unintentionally be building with the wrong materials. So we need to be careful. Finally, Paul warns and maybe even encourages the believers to be careful to build for the reward. Verse 14, if what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. If it is burned up, the builder will suffer loss, but yet will be saved, even though only as one escaping through the flames. We should live our lives on this earth for a reward in the next life. It can be tempting to think that doing something for the purpose of reward is the wrong motivation. We should be doing these things just because they're the right thing to do. But that's not what the Bible calls. In fact, the Bible repeatedly calls us to pursue the reward that awaits those who are faithful in their work for the Lord. When our work is tested, if it survives, we will receive a reward. Again, like we mentioned when we looked at the idea of being rewarded as God's faithful servants in the field, this idea of reward should be astonishing to us. It is far from what we deserve and it's all an act of God's grace. But if our work fails, the testing of fire, if we've been building with the wrong materials, then our work will be proven for what it is. It'll be shown to be worthless. Know how Paul clarifies that this isn't a determinant of our salvation. It's not the person getting burned. You'll still be saved, but the things you've been living your life for will prove to be worthless. So we should be careful to build on the right foundation with good materials that endure and survive so we can receive the joyous reward for our labor. So to wrap up this morning, we have seen how the church, how the ecclesia, how the people of God is compared to a field and a building. And there are two truths that I want us to take home this morning from this. Firstly, I want us to take home that God is at work. With both these analogies, we see a God who is constantly working on and among and through his people. He is the master farmer who makes things grow. He is the master builder who gives us the plans and our roles. We are just servants doing our assigned tasks. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10 says, For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. We are saved by grace, not by our own works, because we are God's handiwork. We are God's project. We are the work of God. And Philippians 1.6 says, he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Notice how there's no uncertainty here. Because God began his good work in you, he will, he promises to carry it on to completion, to complete that work in you. God loves to work in the field of his people feeding, fertilizing, pruning, and harvesting. He loves to work on the building project of his church, shaping each living stone to fit perfectly on the foundation of Jesus. God is always at work in us and through us. So where do you see God at work in your life? Where do you see God at work in your life? If God is working like these passages teach, where is he working? What area is he working on in your life right now? How is he changing your behavior and your attitude? How is he changing your thinking, your outlook? How is he proving himself faithful to you? And we can ask him, we can invite him to work more in us. When was the last time you asked God to work on your life? When did you last ask God, to, uh, invite God to change you and make you more into his likeness? When did you last surrender to the process of God's work? And the second truth I want us to be reflecting on is not only that God is at work, but we are invited to work with him. God is at work and he invites us 
to join him in that work with him. Again, this should be astonishing that God would choose to use us. Does God need us? No way. Does God delight to use us? Absolutely. In all our brokenness and sinfulness and weakness, God delights to work in and through his people. He takes great joy in taking the weak and foolish things of this world and doing wonderful things through them that only His power can do. If you are a follower of Jesus, then you are invited into this work. But the thing we need to be careful of is that if we don't get involved in God's building work, this does not mean that you've now removed yourself from the building business. Whether you like it or not, you are building something with your life. You are working in some field. And so how are you at work in God's field for his kingdom? If someone were to ask you, what is the appointed task that God has for you in his field, what would you say? If you don't know the answer to that question, then I hope and pray that this question will take root in your heart and in your mind until you figure it out. The very God of the universe is inviting you into this work of building his eternal kingdom. What else is more worthy to live your life for? And so I want to give you a couple of moments to reflect on these two truths before I pray. How is God at work in your life? Ask him to work more. How are you at work for God's kingdom? Ask him to show you your assigned task. So take a moment, and I want you to pray to the Lord about these things. And if you want to talk about something with regard to this, please feel free to come and uh, speak with me after the service or reach out to me this week through Slack or by contacting the office. But I'll give you a moment now, and then I'll pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you're a God who is at work. We thank you that you don't leave us in our sin. You don't leave us alone, but you're working. Even before we wanted bringing people around you, bringing us into homes that loved you. And Father, we're so thankful for that work you were doing. And thank you that you worked in our lives and continue to do so to make us more into the likeness of Jesus. Father, I ask that you would reveal to each of us the tasks that you have for us. Thank you so much that you invite us into this work, even though you have no need of us whatsoever. I'm thankful that we get to be part of your amazing work for your kingdom. And I pray that we would seek out our role and do it wholeheartedly and faithfully so we can have the great joy of seeing you at work in this life and the great expectation of reward in the next, all because of your grace to us. And so we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.